From Fox 8 Sports, this is the Overtime Podcast. From the Fox 8 Studios in New Orleans, this is the Fox 8 Overtime Podcast. I'm Vasilios. That is Sean Fazan. Remember to like, subscribe, rate, and review. You guys can find us wherever you listen to and watch your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, mm-hmm. hit the bell notification button right there. You get updated every time we upload a new podcast. Mm-hmm. Sean Fazan, it is the first Wednesday yeah. of the off season for your New Orleans Saints. Kind of weird feeling, right? I, I got up today and I kind of did my Wednesday routine because Wednesday is a pretty busy day for us during a regular it season. Is. This is the first Wednesday we don't have the normal Wednesday grind of Saints practice, game plan, new week, new injuries, all that stuff. So uh, the off season is here, and you know the off season can be um, can be as interesting as the actual season at times. And we're going to get into a couple of off season topics coming up here shortly, but. We're going to kind of fall into this recap season mode and what could be coming up ahead for certain players and coaches up ahead uh, Well, the next few podcasts. And today I thought we're going to hit on a a topic that I know y'all love to talk about, topic I love to talk about because (laughs) these are the types of topics that get people talking. And we got a lot to talk about today with these topics. Did I get all the T words? Uh, I think so. The alliteration. You want to say topics again? The the, (laughs) the, uh, the, the alliteration was off the charts there. So, yeah. We're going to get into it. So how about the big picture? All right. So the big picture, and I mean, I want to argue this might be the biggest picture of the season. Mm -hmm. How would you rate Derek Carr's season in 2023? Oh, Sue, they are not going (laughs) to like me today. They're not going to like me at all today. I'm about to praise the guy, the fan base, or half the fan base loves to hate. And that includes people in my own family and inner circle of friends. I don't care. Go cry (laughs) in the comment section. Just don't let your emotions cloud what you know is true. And if you don't know, let me enlighten you. Derek Carr, wait for it, had a good season. Wait for it. He had a better season than you want to admit. Don't let your emotions blur you from the fact that he was an upgrade. Why did y'all hate this man so much? Relentlessly booed this guy. I still can't. Can you believe that scene in Detroit? I I still cannot believe that scene in Detroit. Booing him, cheering Taysom, booing him, cheering Taysom. Y'all mocked him. Y'all memed him. <laughs> Use car for sale. Use car for sale. Uh, uh, fancy car bogs down when he gets inside the 20. Get it? Get it? Uh, car, his last name. Get it? Get it? I mean, like. Hey, I made plenty of car yeah, puns like, this season. Get it? Huh? I mean, I, the, the, the <laughs> meme where I, I had like 30 people sending the meme where the kids open in the, the present and it's a car. Um, he's crying at the car jerseys and, and the people behind him are giving him the finger. I'm like. Congratulations. Hey, all right, cool. Uh, yeah, very original. Uh, everybody had the same exact meme sent over or some clever uh, or think it was clever nickname for Derek Carr. But y'all <laughs> know full well, y'all know full well the hate y'all gave this man was not even close to the level of play he put on the field. Seriously now. Seriously. This is not – I have no personal connection to Derek Carr. I, I didn't know him before. I know him the little bit we have this season. But seriously, go game the game. Where was he so awful that it warranted catastrophic meltdowns by the fans and the media and the talking heads all season? I didn't do that because I I saw a guy that his bad was wasn't terrible. It was kind of whatever. His good was was not great. But he never even had a game where he had multiple interceptions. Yeah, he didn't have a single game where he had multiple interceptions. I guess you could say his worst game was just the game where he had almost no stats, and that was the game against Carolina. Carolina, and he was obviously coming back from injury there. Yeah. Although I will say, I will say this is a little bit of a side note. Some of those meltdowns made me fall on the floor laughing. Some of those people going off <laughs> on certain things and some of the things they were saying. And it was not worth repeating here uh, on this podcast. No, but another no. podcast where they can be a little more uh, colorful with their language, some of it made me die laughing yeah. we're a family-friendly podcast You're right so. right but no one seemed to <laughs> have a problem with not overreacting when he played well pretty tame in his praise you never saw people just oh my god he's he's the guy but boy when he was not at his best and didn't play great you would have thought he was the worst quarterback that ever put on <laughs> black and gold yet he showed up didn't miss a start. Sometimes maybe there could have been one or two where they probably would have been in the best interest for him not to start, but he battled through his injuries. He was available, played all 17 games, finished with 25 touchdowns, eight interceptions. Derek Carr gave you exactly what he's given every team he's played for his entire career. Good. Comfortably good. Not great. And when he was bad, it was average. It was not terrible. The miscalculation 
the Saints in 2023 was not, let me repeat that, was not giving the keys to Carr. There I go, making car puns. Not giving Carr <laughs> the keys. It was believing you still had some life left in some aging players and an aging roster while simultaneously not having enough young guys ready to contribute fast enough. That was the formula that did not work. They got it together, but it was too little, too late. Contract, contract, contract. We have talked ad nauseum about Derek Carr's contract. Yes, he was have. the 13th highest paid quarterback in the NFL. And if you average out his touchdowns, interceptions thrown, completion percentage, yards, QBR rating. I did the ranking, like with each one, like – he was like 10 in touchdown passes. I don't know where he was, like five in completion percentage, whatever. It would average out to about 11th. So, like, he was, he just wasn't that, that far off in terms of the money uh, that they gave him. So, all in all, I thought he had a pretty good season. What is the deal with people being, like, upset over D.A. defending him? Of course he's going to defend him. That's his That's guy. That's his guy. He like, basically tied his whole career, he basically tied his old Saints uh, sort of, existence as head coach to Derek Carr. I mean, if you really want to be thorough about it, you can say this is the second time he's tied himself to Derek yeah, Carr. Yeah, exactly. So, and that was back when he was a rookie and he only lasted exactly. four games. So, of course he is. But I got to say, look, the DA made some mistakes. But I I don't think Derek Carr was necessarily a mistake based on... I, people doing the revisionist history thing with Baker Mayfield, please stop. Like, <laughs> there was no way this offseason people were high on Baker Mayfield. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear that. But let me also say this, because, I, look, I, I, this is not going to just be a Derek Carr sort of, like, praise fest. We got to be real. Yeah. And I'm going to be real right now. There were struggles. And two struggles really stood out to me. One, I believe, is fixable and got fixed towards the end of the season. The other, honestly, is just what you got to deal with with Derek Carr. The first one is this. The comfort within the system and the chemistry building process between him, the coordinator, the receivers, the offensive line took way too long to settle in. It took way too long for that to work. That can't just be on the coaching staff and the other players. Derek Carr has to take his share of the blame for that because that manifested itself on the field with bad body language, with blow-ups. Mm -hmm. Derek Carr has to do better with that. I think he got a little bit better with that towards the end of the season. He has to be more aware of that. You're the quarterback. You have to be more aware of that. Sure. Plus, uh, the other, honestly, and I just think this is one of those he is who he is. It's not going to change. Carr needs a lot of things to go well around him, to be right around him, to reach the consistent level of play that this team needs from him. He needs great protection. He needs great receivers. His play is never going to be great enough to overcome blatant deficiencies in other areas. He's just not a true multiplier. Very few are. He's just not a true multiplier. I, don't, I think that's a pretty fair criticism of where he's at as a player and what he did this season. The good news is, the good news is, the Saints now know that. The yeah. Saints know exactly what he needs. There's no more guessing. There's no more figuring it out. I think he knows. I, I think we have a big enough sample size both here and his entire career with the Raiders. You can win with Derek Carr. I don't think he's ever going to be a spectacular quarterback, but I think he is a comfortably good quarterback who had, when you average it all out, not just the first mm -hmm. eight weeks of the season, when you look at the entire season, he comes out as a having a pretty good season for the Saints in 2023. I'm sure the comments are really, really happy right now. I'm sure the commenters are going to be happy. And, and you know what I'm thinking, too, is that, like you say, he, he's never going to be great. He might not win you games but he's also not going to outright lose you games either but uh it's like at the beginning of the season when when jeff duncan polled everybody yeah. and took everybody's records i said the presence of Derek carr alone was going to will this saints team to a 10 and 7 record yeah if he doesn't get hurt in that green that bay game, may have been the case that's a great point so i mean like you, you, i guess you couldn't a really bagged up car yeah and uh and you know despite all the things you see in the first year player and with the new organization the, the feeling out process, the working through the kinks and all that stuff, like they still were plus two win wise. So I think he, yeah. he contributed to that. He wasn't the sole reason for that. Oh, I mean, no, no, no. Absolutely. Schedule was certainly a big part of that. But it, he wasn't a detriment. Let's just put no, it that way. Absolutely. I don't think he was a detriment. And the only reason why I even bring this up is because I saw this all year, but I, I, I can't ignore like. <laughs> 
the meltdowns. I can't I can't ignore the 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 just the the chaotic, like catastrophic, like get rid of this guy. I'm like, are y'all not watching the same thing I'm watching? It's like, are so y'all much not? hyperbole from I the know, fans. I like, know, I like, know. And look, look I get, I'm guilty of it too. Yeah, I say it about John Harbaugh at yeah, least three right. times a week with the Ravens. Yeah, and look, it, it's it's one of those things where it's like, I get it, but I think a lot of it is he is the he is the guy. Excuse me, he is the next guy up, but he is the latest guy of three years of mediocrity. So it's like they have just let it all out yep. uh, on him and obviously Dennis Allen. We're going to get to Dennis Allen in our next pod because I know a lot of y'all want to talk about that as well. But um, I just thought it was pretty – I wanted to just kind of lay that out there and see, you know, because I know that the, the people that didn't like him let us know a lot. And a For lot sure. of the times that I – Went out of my way to. I don't think I was ever high in praise. I was just, I was pretty normal in praise, uh, and and at the, the times I was never like when I was criticizing. I wasn't like get this bum out of here. Mm. We, we we got we got a little, we we caught a little feedback from that. But I'm I'm ready I'm ready to hear that that, that side of the story because now we have a full season to look at, and and that finish you can't ignore that finish. No, you um, can't. And I think the, he said the last eight games of the season it was probably more the last six or seven. I would I would say so. I think overall. Um, that's where I, I stood on the 2023 version of Derek Carr with the New Orleans Saints. Yeah, and I think when it comes down to it, I think his season was good. I'm he definitely picked it up towards the end, like mm-hmm. you mentioned. And it, this the Saints realized that in order to make the Derek Carr project really worked. The running game needed to, to succeed a little bit better, so they got a little bit more well, creative and, with that. And the play action game. That's what I'm it's saying. Really that's what, what I was leading is. into. I mean, yeah. there, there was a stat. As a matter of fact, I retweeted it. Um, let me go ahead and read that right now because I think it's important. Sure. Um, this is from Matthew um, <coughs> Paris, the Saints beat writer for NOLA.com. Mm-hmm. After the bye week, the Saints had 50 play action dropbacks over the final seven games. That's more than they had in the first 10. They had 44 in the first 10. So Why did it something. take so long to get there? Look at the result. Look at the result. So... Again, all part of the process. It just it just took too long to figure this thing out, and it's a mm. shame because honestly, they had a chance to really uh, do some things pretty well, uh, or at least make the playoffs, win the division, and do something in the postseason. Anyway, sure. what else we got? So, moving on, we got. So we talked ad nauseum about it last podcast about the uh, victory formation touchdown at the end of the game, and we talked about how Jameis Winston said it was a team decision, speaking like a guy, and we saw a question like this, speaking like a guy who knows he's played his last snap for the Saints. Do you think that's the case? Has Jameis Winston played his last snap? Well, well, let me just start off by saying I was dead wrong about this last year. I thought last year was his last year in black and gold. Somehow he managed to come on (laughs) back. Same thing with Michael Thomas. (laughs) Everything else. But look, Jameis just turned thirty. I don't think I. I think it was this was realistically going to be his last year, and that was before the last snap of the uh, twenty twenty three season. Um, and look, it's I think it's important to point out, point out that at least for the most part, since that's happened, the Saints have somewhat downplayed it. They've a lot of guys they've rallied to it, but mm. it just goes to show you like. It felt like a guy that knew that he wasn't going to be back at some point. So, yep. um, and this is kind of a, a side, a side uh, note to the Derek Carr discussion because I can totally live with people that aren't fans of Derek Carr. I really can. It's not he's not for. I mean, like, if you don't think he's a good quarterback, so be it. If you think he's an average quarterback, so be it. Everybody has their preferences, mm-hmm. and and the truth of the matter is, it did take a while for him to figure it out. And they were only nine and eight. They didn't get into the postseason. He's only been to the postseason once. He's led two teams. Only played in one game because he was hurting the other one. So, I don't have a problem with that. But I still sense that there are a significant portion of people in the fan base, media, that still think Jameis Winston is the best <laughs> option. It drives me nuts. We talked about this People still <laughs> think Jameis is the best option to start at quarterback for the New Orleans Saints. I mean, they're covering the team to think that. I mean, it's not hard to figure out who. Yeah. I'm like, I, I mean, I can't. I can't even begin to to. I just shake my head. I need people to stop watching that four or five game stretch from the beginning of twenty twenty one. 
And I am so glad you said that because I got in my note right here because I people were going to bring that up. Yes, they went five and two or four and two. However, you view that Tampa game where he was lost after the first quarter. But I know for a fact, a fact, not guessing here, mm -hmm. not guessing here. The former head coach, who he had his most success under, was not going to bring him back if he would have returned in twenty twenty two. That told me all I needed to know. That told me all I needed to know. Look, Jameis is a great teammate. I happen, funny. I happen to think he's hilarious. Yes. He has been nothing but great to us. But actually on the field, when it comes to football, no. He's not. He, he's, I think he's a spot starter, high-end backup in the NFL, and now that he's a free agent, maybe there's a better opportunity elsewhere. But you can't ignore like the little bit of the dynamics there of, okay, going against your head coach and that sort of thing. Because, I, look, I, like I said in the last pot, I think he was the ringleader. I think he said, let, 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 let's just do Jamal win. Let's get him a, let's get him a touchdown. Yeah. I was like, yeah, let's go. He's the ultimate team guy. I think he was the guy that kind of got the – Got the ball rolling. He's got that. that energy, dude. He's just he's gonna he's gonna convince everybody. Of yeah, of course. Yeah, and like and and, look, and he's got enough arm talent to where he's just gonna kind of take over. And he's got that magnetic personality. Exactly. He's gonna take over. And you know, sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's a it, it's a challenging thing. Sometimes it's it's a kind of is what it is type thing. But mm -hmm. I think now you're talking about 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. That's four years at Jameis, and it was like 10 starts maybe total. And you came in as, as Drew's backup, then battled with Taysom, then had the job in 2020. He obviously got hurt in 2021, then got mm -hmm. hurt again in 2022. And then um, obviously came back to be the backup in, in 2023. It's been an interesting ride. I didn't think he was going to be here that long unless he was going to be the guy to be kind of the – maybe starter for this long and obviously ended up finishing up as a backup. So if he didn't get hurt in 21. He might have been the guy. Who, who knows? Who knows? Um, but I do know even in 21, there was some frustration with how they had certainly to, how they had to coach the offense and handle the offense when he was at the helm. I, I, I'm not guessing there, guys. I'm not beating up on James. I am. I am telling you facts. These were actually actual storylines. This is I, this is I these are based off very real and frank conversations. But regardless, back to the original question. Although I've been wrong before, I don't believe Jameis is back next season. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's a lot of there's going to be quite a few jobs open. I mean, we see how many and they got yeah, they got coaching Hain positions. They got they too. got Jake Hayner, a guy that yeah. uh, like they liked in training camp and preseason. I think he can develop into a number two quarterback. I don't think he'll be a starter, but I think he can develop into a decent backup. Um, so yeah, young guy there. Maybe maybe that's the direction they go. But I, I, if I'm Jameis, I'm I'm probably in more a little more interested in maybe trying to find an opportunity where yeah. even if I'm not the quote unquote starter, maybe the starter starter's a little shakier, and I would have a chance to come on the field right. and, and and make plays and and maybe he could just be a bridge guy, you and know, do like, it and, and kind of pull a Geno Smith exactly, like, kind of pull a Geno Smith exactly. I mean, Jameis has has a, a lot of options here. There's seven coaching openings as of the taping of this podcast. Yeah. I mean, who knows if. If they're one of those teams drafts a quarterback high, maybe he can come in and play a few spot starts yeah. until that quarterback is ready. But yeah, I, I'm with you there. I think I think Jameis should test the waters after kind of opting out of that last season. We'll see what happens. But speaking of quarterbacks mm -hmm. and teams drafting a quarterback, do you think it's still in the cards for the Saints at the 14th overall pick in the draft to t select the quarterback? All right, I reserve the right to change my mind here based off conversations <laughs> I will have between now. And the draft and, you know, the senior bowl is coming up and then there's the combine and then there's just, you know, you know, it's off season. People are a little more casual, a little loose. Sometimes you can just have just conversation, just get a feel for where things are. Mm -hmm. But if it were up to me, the Saints at 14 drafting the quarterback only if they have a shot at the top three. Mm -hmm. Caleb Williams, Drake May, uh, Jaden Daniels. Sure. LSU. If you have a shot. At one of the top three, then I say I would strongly consider that option. Um, I just don't believe, as we sit here right now, again, I reserve the right to change my mind based off conversations that I will inevitably have. I just have a hard time believing right now the Saints have Michael Penix, Bo Nix, or J.J. McCarthy, even though mm -hmm. at the time of this podcast he hadn't, he hadn't made any decision about his future, that they would have him number 14 on their board. Mm-hmm. What I'm getting at is, 
I think the Saints should consider it, but I wouldn't overdraft. So at 14, if Penix is, let's say Penix is the highest of, of that next tier, and it's like 23, I just I don't see him doing that. I, I think they would probably have someone ranked higher on their board. I wouldn't overdraft for a quarterback at 14 if it's one of that next tier. If it's one of the top three, again, as we sit here right now, yes, I would consider that option. But things always change. Okay, so I want to play into that theory a little bit, okay. the top three theory. So looking at the the – Picks that come before the Saints. You got uh, the Bears, who are going to be selecting number one. Do you think they select a quarterback? Or do you think they go after Marvin Harrison Jr.? I think they take a quarterback. Okay. So that's one quarterback off the board. Say mm-hmm. say that's Caleb Williams, mm-hmm. right? Washington. Yes. They go quarterback. So that's, say, Drake May. Yep. New England? Uh, yes. All right. So that's then Jayden. that's, that's Jaden. So, so it really boils down to Chicago, right? Yeah, it does. So if say they take Marvin Harrison, Washington would they takes do that, Caleb. or would they trade out to a quarterback to a team that wants a quarterback at one overall? That would be an insane haul, and we've seen insane hauls yeah. in the past for the number one overall pick. Uh, if there's a team out there that has enough draft capital to want to give that up, I mean they but, were that team last year, yeah, and but, then now they're they're back again, and they can, I mean, if they're not in, uh, yeah. I, but say you make it out of the what top would you do? Three. Would you because I I saw Justinville's got better, and then I watched that Green Bay game. And I understood the frustration when I watched it because, like, he's a guy that makes up for down to down inefficiency with wild, explosive plays where it offsets the the down to down, just not quite the precise type quarterback that you know can do that. You can win with that style, yeah. but I understand the frustration because that style has not translated to more wins for Chicago. So as we sit here right now, if I were running that show, I would probably go Caleb Williams. See to me, it, they kind of put like the uh, the bumpers down, like in the bowling alley for for um, for Justin Fields at, towards yeah. the end of the season. And you kind of saw when he's allowed to make his own decisions and play, he, yeah. he can he can make something happen. But picture this, okay? So say one of these top three is left, but you you and they make it out of the top three, you still have Atlanta at eight, who's definitely going to want one of those guys at quarterback if they're still yeah. available too. So there's no chance that one of these and, guys falls out. And, of the and top here's 10, the thing: right? I, this is, it is my assumption, and probably wrong to assume that you know the the three second three. I call it the second tier guys, but there's a chance. Look at this point last year, Anthony Richardson wasn't wasn't up there with Stroud and, and mm. Bryce Young, and he worked his way all the way up to number three. Yeah, combine warriors. And then, man. Uh, Levis went in the other direction. <laughs> So there's certainly a chance Penix can work his way back up, but I, you know, they they were all ready to crown him, uh, uh, crown him the next saint, uh, and inside the Supernova. Mm-hmm. And then when I watched what, when he got pressure against Michigan, how much he just was not the same player. And I mean, he had open throws, he missed throws by not seeing them, he missed throws by being off target. Um, look, it's 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 one game, but it was a big game. So I I thought I, I still think there's a gap between those three. Um, it depends on how high you have that second tier of quarterback rated. And that's where this boil, what's, what it's going to boil down to when it comes to the Saints. Because right now, I would not have any one of those three, Knicks, McCarthy, and of course, Penix, mm. as 14th rated player in this draft. All right. So one, uh, and if, I know it's way too early, but if the Saints don't select a quarterback at 14, what position does your gut tell you that you feel like they might go? It's either going to be defensive end or tackle. That's what I think right now. Um, just look at their... Look at their track record. Sure. Um, look what they need. Um, you have Ramchek's dealing with his situation. Who knows how much longer he has left. Andrews Pete's a free agent. He played well. Is he your left tackle of the future? Penning is, you know, they want to develop Penning. But is that a possibility? Does he kick inside? Can you count on him? Absolutely not. And then defensive end, you got to draft Cam's replacement at some point. Um and they haven't gotten anything out of Peyton Turner. And I know Granderson had a good year, but to me, that, that it, it, the proof's in, in, in the recent history. So I think they would go line of scrimmage. All right. Any uh, any thoughts as we head into no, the No, that was a good one, huh? That was a good one. I agree. I hope they like me after this spot. <laughs> you know, know. We'll, we'll have to check the comments and yeah, see. But we'll see. <laughs> for Sean Fazan, I'm Vasily. This has been the Fox 8 Overtime Podcast. We'll catch you guys on the next one.